Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to ISIS Parenting's breastfeeding webinar and chat. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm a mom and baby nurse educator, board certified lactation consultant, and board certified in pediatrics. I'm sitting here in ISIS Parenting's home office outside of Boston, Massachusetts. With me today is a very special friend and guest, Kate, and she has with her her beautiful eight and a half day old yeah. son, Emmett. Mm -hmm. And um, so welcome, Kate. It's so nice to have you actually live in studio. Thank you so much. We are happy to be here. And it's about to start snoozing away. He's doing such good nursing with Nancy's help. Well, I, have, I saw this picture. And I have to say, even when I saw Emmett, when you walked in today, he looks like he's a month old. He's not. It's not that he's large. He he was. How big was he when he was born? Seven pounds fourteen ounces. Okay, so he's probably a he's probably a, he's probably about that size or eight, maybe eight pounds now. So he doesn't. It's not that he looks like he's a month old in terms of size, but he's very alert and he doesn't have like the brand new kind of ET look to him. <laughs> you know, I, I say this often, but it's true that Steven Spielberg actually modeled ET after the human newborn to have similar characteristics that make you feel nurturing and endearing toward him. So think about oh. E.T. He's got the, the oversized broad head and the big eyes and the thin scrawny neck, extra wrinkles in the forehead. So E.T. really was modeled after the, the brand new human. Uh, but uh, your son does not look like, like E.T. <laughs> at, at all. Um, in fact, he's quite beautiful. And um, he's not your first. No, I have a three-year-old at home uh, who is very excited to be a big brother. Yes. Is, and is today, he's just three, right? Yes, just yesterday three. was his birthday. Okay. All right. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what it's like when you are a brand new mom and you have a brand new baby and you're working on breastfeeding. And the reason I came up with this idea is because Kate is a, an old friend of mine um, and uh, through ISIS. And I helped her with her first son uh, trying to get some breastfeeding issues resolved with him. And we've stayed in close contact. And um, she emailed me yesterday with a bunch of questions, breastfeeding new baby type questions, as, as people tend to do. And I said, sure, I can answer those, but I'm really swamped with work right now. So maybe I could just read them live on the webinar and answer them on the webinar, and you could listen in on the webinar, or you could actually, I could turn your mic on, and you could actually talk on the webinar, or you could actually come in, because you said you wanted to show me this beautiful baby boy. So I said, get your butt in here. <laughs> Here you are. So this is great. And we don't have any cameras, uh, for which I'm usually grateful. But I swear I wish we had cameras today because <laughs> we did do a little latch work, a little repositioning. This kid is zonked out, looks gorgeous on, on mom. And um, so let's just do a little, a little checklist. I'm going to use the same deck that I used um, about a month ago when I did uh, breastfeeding the first days at home. So for those of you who may be expecting um, or brand new babies, I did days one, two, and three in the hospital, and then I did um, a separate webinar, which was days three to seven, uh, or the first week at home, life with a brand new baby. And um, so I am kind of revised that, plus I integrated some slides because Kate had some questions about a little nipple soreness and some positioning issues. And so we'll just go through all of these things and we'll use it as a little checklist to check in with Kate and see how she's, how she's doing. Um, and by the way, Katie, thank you so much for pitching in today. Uh, Katie is uh, one of our old faithful webinar moderators and she's stepping in to, to fill in uh, a hole that we had and I really do appreciate that, Katie. So thanks a lot. Uh, in the perfect world, a baby is born, crawls right up on mom, and latches on, and everybody goes off into the sunset happily breastfeeding forever and ever until they wean. We all know in the real world, it doesn't always happen that way at all. Um, but Kate, did you have a lot of initial difficulties getting Emmett latched on, or did he did, was he born, brought up skin to skin, and latched within the first hour or two? Yeah, we did not have any latch issues in the beginning. So he was born um, very quickly. I had a very quick labor. He sort of shot out, and they put him right up on my chest. And a couple minutes later, he sort of bobbed his head around, and we showed him the breast. And he, I don't know that he was really drinking anything, but the latch was fine. He was sucking away, and everybody said, oh, that's so great. And um, then they had to take him away, and he was having some, he was a bit purple from a fast labor and had some um, respiratory issues, so they took him out and, and the doctors took a look at him, but even when he came back, he was doing a really good job latching. Okay. That's great, um, because it doesn't, it doesn't always matter that the baby doesn't latch right away, but if the baby can transition at 
the chest at, at mom's naked chest and even if they just nuzzle or lick and snuggle it's really it's really the optimal place for them to start i don't I, I usually call that just being at the table so the baby may not eat but at least at the table he has the opportunity um, so we kind of kind of skip over the, the early days which isn't really fair but we don't have three hours um, mm -hmm. to go through the hospital the hospital environment and the hospital um, experience in relationship to breastfeeding that can be you know the good the bad the ugly um, but let's talk about what it's like when life with life when you come home because you were actually you left the hospital on the second day is that right we did yeah we left a little bit early because i had my three-year-old at home and we missed him and we were ready to bring the baby home i felt more confident this time around as a second time mom i felt like i knew what i needed to do once we got home so we were ready about a day and a half after he was born when you leave the hospital early like that were you offered a home visit from a nurse i was and i actually said i think we're doing fine i don't really need it i also knew i had nancy uh under my thumb as a lactation person. And that was really the only thing that I was nervous about. Everything else seemed really good. Um, he was not jaundiced. I was feeling pretty good. So I, I figured the only help we were going to need was, was lactation. Mm -hmm. I think that it's something worth noting because the first couple days in the hospital, if your recovery is going well, breastfeeding, you have all those hands around and the breast is sore and sometimes, I'm sorry, is soft. And then sometimes what happens is moms go home on day three or day four and that's when the milk begins to come in and that's really when people begin to have a harder time with latching and with breastfeeding. Um, so basically the, you know, the first few days arriving home, these are the things that we hope happens and then we'll check in with Kate to see uh, what her experience was like in terms of this. So during days three to seven after the baby arrives, we hope that your milk will come in more fully, but not too fully. So there's a difference between fullness and engorgement. Engorgement means the breasts are rock hard, hot, and painful. Full and firm is a little bit different. And um, we also hope that the baby will latch at most feeding attempts. So they may not latch or stay awake at the breast each and every time. And that's why I would encourage moms to try to bring the baby to breast eight or 10 or 12 times in 24 hours because every feeding is not gonna go smoothly. Sometimes the baby may cry, sometimes mom may cry, sometimes the baby may fall asleep. Not every feeding will be successful. So if you're trying at least 10 times, you know that at least seven or eight of them will probably work out well. And we want to get that milk, the colostrum, and then the early milk transferring because that's how you're going to start moving the meconium out and bringing the milk in more thoroughly. Um, and um, you'll see the increase in urine output and then the transitional poop that goes from meconium to that greenish, blackish, grayish poop, and then more to a greenish yellow, and then finally to some, some type of uh, mustard ish poop and then hopefully mom's nipples may be tender especially at latch but hopefully not too damaged uh, or not painful enough to dread the next feeding so thinking about this list kate where would you say that you guys were at or are at about a week after emmett's arrival about a week out now i feel like we are definitely nursing 12 about 12 times we're doing it about every three hours at night and about every two hours during the day um, and my breasts are full and I can tell when it's time to feed him. They get like very firm, but I haven't felt engorgement pain. I didn't feel engorgement pain when my milk first came in. Um, it seemed to come in gradually. I think more gradually than with my first baby. I feel like with the first, it sort of came in all at once, or maybe I just didn't know what it felt like until that point. Um, but it came in pretty gradually. And it came in a little later than I expected. They sort of, when they sent me home, they said, oh, he's been nursing so well. I bet your milk will come in tomorrow morning. You'll be good to go. And then tomorrow morning came and he was still kind of stuck in colostrum, but frustrated and I was frustrated. And it took an, another full day for things to sort of settle down at home. Um, so it took a little longer than I expected, but when it did come in, we both knew. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely felt firm and all of a sudden he was happier when he was drinking. I could hear the swallowing and the gulping and um, and now a week out, <laughs> he's smiling, he's smiling and laughing in his sleep. Um, a week out, I, I I feel like we're getting into a groove. I can tell when he's actually drinking. He seems very happy after a good feeding. His belly's full. He'll just lay down with his eyes open for a while, and um, we have a we have a groove now. <laughs> he is. He's he's doing that that adorable smiling in his sleep. Um, and what about your your nipples. We'll talk a little bit more about yeah. nipple issues, but um, 
Yeah, so I think in the first few days, the, the lactation, I had asked for a lot of lactation support in the hospital. And so lactation saw me and they showed me how to latch and we were doing a lot of nursing in the hospital when it was just colostrum coming out. And I think probably in my effort to do it so much, we did some bad latching and I just sort of let it go thinking like, well, nursing is better than not nursing. And um, I think I probably got some blisters or, or bruising or whatever it was at that point that even when I started doing it right, it hasn't really resolved. So I'm still having a little bit of lingering pain, but not extreme pain. So I can tell that the latch is right now, but I still feel little blisters and pinching sometimes. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that. And that's exactly right. You know, if you wipe out on your bike and you completely scrape up and skin your knee, then it's going to hurt for several days and there's damage there. There's there's some skin damage there. And especially like your knee, your nipple, you're using it all the time. So if there is a, a scrape or an open area or a blister or any type of a, a crack, you're going to feel it every single time you feed, even though your, your technique may be improved. Um, but we will talk about that and get it healed up a little bit. Um, in terms of the first week, the transition of diapers, Kate's laughing at my mustard picture. <laughs> any range, any range of hot, bright yellow hot dog mustard to speckly brown mustard. Um, and of course, uh, the baby is usually a fan of finding a parent to poop on. Um, oh, he did not like my joke, huh? Okay, I think we'll we'll pass over this one because he's feeding well. So at this point now, he's peeing and pooping nicely. Uh, common concerns that new moms often have are we talked about engorgement, some latch issues, soreness, the jaundice, and the sleepy baby, and the baby that loses a lot of weight. And by the way, when a baby loses a lot of weight, sometimes a good question to ask is: Was mom bolused? Uh, did mom receive? many, many liters of IV fluid. If there was a longer labor, which Kate did not have, but if there were a longer labor and an epidural and bag after bag or after bag of IV fluid, mom is a little bit overinflated and the baby is born artificially hydrated and pees a lot during the first 24 hours. And that by the second 24 hours makes it look like the baby has lost more than 10% of the weight. Okay, Kate's working on latching. Look at that. Look at that. You did a beautiful job. Does that feel okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's the good side. <laughs> this is the comfortable side, but you were saying you think so so <laughs> play by play report here, folks. So <laughs> Emmett is now latched on Kate's left breast, and Kate had said that her right breast is more sore and the nipple is more sore and has a lot more milk. The left breast was you were did you say by email that he gets frustrated on this side? He does. So it, it almost seems like there's not as much milk and it's it's physically smaller. I mean I can see that it's not as quite as full when it's full. Um, so he'll often latch on on the side and suck for a minute and if nothing comes out he gets frustrated. And then even when it lets down, he'll sort of go for five minutes or so, but not much more. And then he either falls asleep or just spits it back out or the, the nipple, not the mm -hmm, milk, mm -hmm. and just doesn't really stay there very long. Okay, so Kate had asked by email, is there a way she can work on evening out the two sides? And my answer to that is that as humans, we're not symmetric people. So uh, if you draw, draw a line down your middle, we have a heart on one side, we have a spleen on one side. Um, we don't have, you know, we don't have two of everything. and one of your feet may be a little bit bigger, one of your ears may be a little bit higher, and it's very common for nursing moms to have one breast that's either easier for the baby to latch onto or produces more milk, or they may like the breast that produces less milk because the breast that produces more milk may uh, spray and choke them out and flood them a little bit. So between the two breasts, though, you can make the milk that he needs. I would suggest when he's starting to get a little bit antsy on that left side, use the breast compression and massage we talked about. Um, it sounded like you were doing a good balance of starting him on the side he preferred and then letting him suck for a longer period of time on the side he doesn't like quite so much so that when he's really impatient and eager, uh, sometimes putting the baby on the breast that doesn't produce quite as much milk when they're very hungry is a benefit because they'll work harder to get the milk. Sometimes it's a drawback because the baby can get frustrated. So you kind of have to play with it and see. But I, I do agree that you want to you want to 
provide stimulation to that side quite a bit to try to encourage full milk production. And it's not surprising though, if one breast is a little bit larger or seems to produce more milk. Some moms don't notice this until they're doing more pumping. Uh, and some moms will know that uh, they can nurse on one breast very easily, but in, on another side, they need to use only one particular nursing hold, for example, to get the baby latched on. All right, I'm gonna skip over this slide, except that for new people that um, haven't seen some of my webinars before, you may not know what I'm showing you here. And uh, what I'm showing you here is my analogy that an engorged breast is like a beach ball with an M&M glued onto it covered in olive oil. Very, very hard for a baby to latch onto. Um, and if they aren't able to latch, they basically gum around the, uh, the nipple, the M&M, and hang on for dear life, and it's very slippery. And um, that's very, it, it can make you very sore. So if you do have true engorgement, um, you wanna soften that up by using heat before and ice packs afterwards, frequent nursing, soften the areola, sometimes a manual pump can help and ibuprofen can help quite a bit. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna pass over latching. So um, sadly, a fair number of women will have sore nipples or an initial uh, crack or blister. And uh, if we can work on the latch and get that improved, making nursing more comfortable and not uh, not recreating another, another uh, crack, then nursing is gonna be more successful. So um, we worked on some latching and some position stuff um, and we'll go over some positioning in a minute, but you always wanna make sure that the baby's nose and belly button are in a straight line and, um, and making sure that the baby is taking more than just a nipple in their mouth. But these products are some things that I had suggested um, for Kate when she emailed me that she had uh, a little bit of a crack, a little bit of a blister and pain uh, on one of the nipples. So using uh, the Soothies or the Hydrogel pad, you can put, place that on right over the nipple. They feel so good. It provides a moist healing environment, which actually helps the nipple heal faster. And then alternate the use with a breast shell or these uh, Thera shells, which are worn over the nipple. They have air holes in them. So they allow the nipple to stand out in space with circulating air and not be smooshed up against the body or the skin. So when you have a sore nipple and you're putting a breast pad over it and then your bra up, it kind of smushes the face of the nipple and, and there's no air circulating around it. Question about those Suzy's pads. So they gave me those in the hospital, and I think they really helped in the first few days. I, so if people aren't offered those, I, I think I had to ask for it. I sort of said, oh, I'm having some nipple pain. What would you suggest? And they brought me one, um, and it helped a lot. One thing I noticed was that it, it makes the nipple a little slimy, which the, a little bit of the lanolin stuff kind of comes off, and it says on the package to wipe it off before you breastfeed. Is, is that necessary? Because I, you know, in the middle of the night, I found myself like trying to pull the baby to me and then being like, oh, I have to wipe this off. Oh, it's bad for him. Da, da, da. You know, is it bad for them or can they, can they just, if he'll tolerate it, can you just leave it on there? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to um, contradict what a uh, product's packaging recommends for you to do. Um, but I do find, I'm surprised, and I wonder if that's just one brand over another. I'm, I'd have to look again at the, at the Medela version of the hydrogels. There's actually no lanolin in the, in, in the Soothies. Um, hydrogel is, um, it's just a, it's a moist pad. It's almost like a layer of gelatin that provides a, a, a better environment for the skin to rejuvenate. Um, and provides comfort as well. So there's no medication in it uh, or lotion or lanolin or anything like that. Usually, no, I would not say you have to wash or rinse the nipple before uh, latching. But again, you know, the disclaimer would be to follow the instructions sure. of, the, of the product. Um, but that can really be comfortable and promote healing. And you have you can alternate that with the Theracells, which also um, promote healing. And lanolin, if you choose to use lanolin, I think of that as chapstick. It's kind of uh, like just a soothing emollient for the nipple. And when it comes out of the tube, it's very thick and tacky, kind of like petroleum jelly. So rub it between your thumb and finger until it turns into oil, and then dab it on gently. So you don't want to smear it on real thick. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, sleep. We did talk a little bit about a sleepy baby. Um, and again, you can go back and review this information if people at home are interested. At, this is um, the, the first week of breastfeeding. If your baby is sleepy, can't stay awake, is jaundiced, these are some tips for them. Uh, jaundice 
jaundice can be an issue because jaundice makes the baby sleepy and a sleepy baby doesn't feed well and a baby that's not feeding well doesn't clear their meconium uh, and doesn't clear their bilirubin and that makes them more jaundiced so it becomes kind of a vicious downward spiral. The answer is improving the milk transfer and um, trying to uh, keep the baby awake and feed well and give them some sunlight or phototherapy if necessary. The bilirubin levels will improve and then gradually the feeding will improve. But meanwhile, protect the milk supply if the baby's not nursing well or if the baby needs to be supplemented, make sure that mom is getting started pumping. Okay. I think we... Tell me the story you told me uh, before we went on microphone about um, weight loss, because I thought um, I really liked I really liked hearing it. It's just the kind of story that I would hope to hear a little bit more often. So uh, Emmett was born at seven pounds, 14 ounces, and that was on a Tuesday, last Tuesday. And on Saturday, we had our first weight check with the pediatrician. Um, and we went in and he was down to seven pounds even. And so they sort of gave me the whole spiel that I, I heard with my first. And um, I think people hear a lot, which is, oh, he's lost a lot of weight. You really need to kick breastfeeding into high gear. We're going to do another weight check. So you have 24 hours to get this number up or else we need to talk about options. Clearly those options would be formula and other, other things. Um, so I went home and I nursed pretty much straight for 24 hours. We did pretty much two hours around the clock. And whenever he seemed fussy, I just stuck my boob in his mouth. And um, he drank a lot. And we went back the next morning at about the same time. And he had gained 2.4 ounces. And then I didn't know if that was good or bad. You know, I didn't have a reference for how much he was supposed to gain. But the nurse said, oh, yeah, we only usually estimate one ounce a day. So he did awesome in that first day. And that gave me the confidence to know that he's eating and he's growing, and so we should just keep doing that for the next few days, and we'll go back in a few more days for another weight check. Yeah, some, uh, that's a great story, and sometimes it depends on when you catch the baby in terms of the lowest point of their of their weight loss, uh, because babies generally do lose weight at first, and then mom's milk comes in, and then they regain the weight they lost, and then begin gaining weight beyond their birth weight. So by the time a baby is 10, 10 days old or so, it would be great if they were back at their birth weight, and by the two-week visit, it would be great if they were a few ounces above their birth weight. And sometimes it's just a question of, is the weight about to turn around? And so uh, probably at this point, he's been gaining nicely, you know, like gangbusters all along. So his weight will, will weigh him after, and that might surprise you, you know, that he, he might have actually, uh, he might be up um, four to eight ounces from that, from that pediatrician visit. Um, and as we always say here, if the baby isn't latching, then you need to get milk going another way. So a breastfeeding contingency plan means getting the milk moving uh, and keeping it moving at least eight times in 24 hours by baby or by pump. And if breastfeeding isn't going well, get some help. Um, skip over here. So let's just review some good positioning stuff. In any breastfeeding position, the nose and the belly button should be in a straight line. So if everybody at home gets a mouthful of spit and then turns their head and tries to look as far as possible over their shoulder and swallow, you'll see it's very hard to swallow with your head turned. So if your baby is laying on his back, with his head turned toward the breast, he's not going to be able to nurse very well. The nose and belly button should always be in a straight line in any position. If you're nursing in uh, the cross cradle position or the cradle hold, like in the picture you see here, tummy to tummy. So the baby and the mom should be tummy to tummy. Um, baby's arm is not a bolster. Take, them, take the arm out between mom and baby. So that's one thing that um, I helped Kate with when she put the baby in, when she put Emmett in a cradle position or a cross cradle position, I reached in and, and showed how we could bring his arm out and around the breast like a hug, as opposed to um, being stuck between her body and his body, which keeps the baby just a little bit further apart. So you want the baby up as close as possible to the breast so they can get a deeper latch. And it's better for the head, the baby's head to be tilted back a little bit, not curled forward. Again, those of you at home, Take a mouthful of spit and tuck your chin down towards your chest and try to swallow. Not very easy, is it? So you need to, if the baby's head is curled forward toward his chest, he's not going to be able to open his mouth wide and get a, a, a deep latch. So you want the baby's head either neutral or slightly extended back. 
um, the, the picture up at the left corner, the not like this picture, you want to try to keep your fingers away from the areola so that the baby has a little bit more space to uh, to reach to get a deeper latch. If your fingers are, are so close to the nipple that, um, that you're restricting the baby's ability to get a mouthful of areola, um, it, makes, it makes it harder to get a deep latch. Lots of little rolled up receiving blanket sausages. <laughs> Those can give you some wrist support, wrist support um, and a nice wide open C hand to support the breast. Just looking at some pictures here. You can go back and look at those later if you want. Cradle position. So I'm not a huge fan of the cradle position during early uh, breastfeeding challenges. I'm just gonna flip through here. Uh, because, hmm, that's an interesting slide, there we go, because um, you have less control over the baby's latch. So I would, I would uh, recommend probably a cross cradle position um, if you're having nipple damage so that you have a better, better ability to help the baby get a deeper latch. And if the latch isn't right, if it's pinchy or shallow, you can get your finger right in there and take him off the breast and, and relatch. Um, if your baby is coughing, choking, spluttering, or you have a very heavy milk letdown, which is something that uh, Kate had asked me about, one of the things I was wondering for her sore nipple is that's the side that flows very rapidly. So I was wondering if maybe Emmett feels like he needs to clamp down uh, or, or everything gets very slippery and wet and he slides down the nipple because there's such a heavy letdown and that's what's making him sore. So here's some positioning tricks for a very heavy letdown and Kate had mentioned you had found a position on your own that actually started to work better. And tell us what that was. Yeah, sort of with him sitting upright in my lap. So sitting down on my leg with his back pretty straight up like a like an adult sitting straight up. Yeah, sort of like that one on the right with the kid in the pink shirt. Mm -hmm. um, sort of upright so that I wasn't, it wasn't dripping into his mouth. And then it, as he sort of gulped, he has like this period where when I first let down where he gulped, 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 gulped 10, 15 times in a row. And sometimes he recovers from it and sometimes he just backs his head off and goes a little crazy. So that helps the gulping and he can sort of pull his head back without unpositioning us, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. Yep, and um, gravity can help as well. So having the baby on top of the breast rather than underneath it. So imagine if you were thirsty and you laid on my lawn and I held my garden hose over your <laughs> mouth. It, you would cough, choke, splutter. It wouldn't be pleasant. And um, that may be how a baby, a new baby feels when mom has a very heavy letdown and the baby is positioned under the breast. So they really don't have an escape from that and they have this flood of milk that is coming in at them. Uh, as opposed to if mom lays back or reclines, the milk is going to flow slower by gravity, and then when the baby is on top of the breast rather than under the breast, they can drink up what they want or need and let the rest of it kind of um, drain away if they need to. But they're in more control over the milk flow in this position. So it will go slower by gravity, and also um, the baby won't feel as, as choked out. Sometimes moms will nurse in these types of positions or having the baby's head higher than the belly or higher than the breast just at the beginning of the feeding session. And then after the milk lets down, after the first couple of minutes, they can move to a more neutral position. Um, a lot of times, if there's a very heavy letdown, it's usually during the initial part of the feeding and then things slow down a little bit. So is that angle position not something you would want to do for a whole nursing session? No, you could if it was okay. comfortable. Okay. Um, or or these, um, or the laid back, this is also called laid back or um, biological nursing position. I like to describe this as imagine you're sitting at your couch and you put your legs up on the coffee table and you recline way back and bring the baby up and over the breast as opposed to underneath the breast. Uh, and if it's comfortable, you can stay that way for the whole the whole feeding. And as you said, you know, if you're out and about somewhere and you've got a three year old, so chances are you will be, you know, at the park, at the playground, at the mall. Um, and uh, these sitting upright positions can work well. Also, a modified football hold, and I'm not sure if I have a good picture of that. Um, so in these football hold positions, you can see a lot of them. The baby is. Uh, is under the breast or at the level of the breast, but you can also bring the baby um, to more of a sitting position in the football hold position so that he's tucked next to you, sitting um, upright next to you and approaching the breast that way. It's actually quite cute because they, they, they look up at you over the breast. I think I had a nice picture of, of a mom, one of our 
Twitter followers doing that. Where'd that go? I don't know what I did with that picture. Maybe it was at the end. Um, okay, so let's see what else we got. If I had anything else I wanted to go over. Did you have a question about his skin? Oh, I did. So probably not related to breastfeeding, but he uh, has very dry skin on his trunk and his arms and hands and feet. Um, and I don't think it's from over bathing since <laughs> it took us a week to give him his first bath because we had so much going on. But um, it's just very scaly, dry skin, and I wasn't sure about lotions or what kind you recommend, if any, what we can do. Mm. I wish you guys could see this beautiful little <laughs> one. He is exceptional. Um, that's a great question and very common because your baby in utero is floating in a liquid environment. And imagine, uh, you know what you look like when you're in the swimming pool or the bath for a really, really, really long time and you come out and you're kind of wrinkly. And really for a baby who's been growing and developing in a liquid environment covered with a layer of uh, a vernix, like a cold, like a nice um, uh, cold cream layer, uh, when they transition to life outside the uterus, they have an oxygen environment around them, and the top layers of skin dry out and eventually slough off. Mm -hmm. So he has a few layers of waterlogged skin, and okay. he's starting to lose those. So it's very normal and natural for a baby to, to see that kind of peeling skin. Um, and because babies have such thin and uh, sensitive skin, I really would not recommend any kinds of lotions um, or oils or soaps at this young age, at, at eight or nine days. Um, there's no problem with the, with the peeling skin, and you also will see kind of like a mixed, um, mixed tone, so you'll see some dry patches, and then you'll see some, you know, sometimes the forehead can look a little oily or greasy even. And that's normal too. So I would just bathe him with clear water and kisses um, and the tincture of time. And then probably uh, around a month old, if you want to start using uh, some kind of a, a gentle baby bath or baby wash. Um, or oh, so they use baby wash in the hospital, and that's what they told me to use going home. So, so you're saying just use water. Instead. Usually, you know, but it's up to you. But yes, usually we say for the first few weeks, just use clear water. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see, I think we have a, a couple questions from a, a brand new mom. We have a, a brand new mom with an 11 day old and her question is, uh, her 11 day old is gaining weight, past birth weight, but doesn't nurse for too long at each breast and gets sleepy quickly. Should I be concerned or are some babies sleepier than others? Many, uh, many babies during the first few weeks are sleepy. Um, she probably does need to sleep as much as 20 hours out of 24, but as you will probably soon discover, most of those sleeping hours will be on you, next to you, or at your breast. So um, if she's willing to be swaddled or um, placed down uh, and take a 45 minute nap, by all means, enjoy that time. Because usually sometime between weeks three to eight, babies don't wanna be put down very much at all. They start spending more and more time awake, but when they're awake, they're not particularly happy and they will sleep at the breast or in your arms only. So uh, it is quite normal for babies to become sleepy as soon as they start to eat. So the milk itself has a hormone in it that makes the baby sleepy and the warm milk hitting the baby's belly uh, makes them sleepy. And some babies will actually fall asleep before they get a full feeding so that um, they, uh, they, fall asleep at the breast and then mom tries to put the baby down for a nap and then within a little while the baby is flailing and hungry again and so on. So some things you can try to keep her eating a little bit more at the breast before you uh, end the feeding is uh, don't feed in a glider rocker or rocking chair. So try to avoid that rhythmic relaxing movement. That's very nice for soothing uh, or for helping her fall asleep. But during a feeding session, probably avoid a rocking chair and rhythmic padding use some gentle annoying um, movements like um, you can gently scratch her ear, poke her leg, uh, move her fingers and toes a little bit, um, you know, tickle her ear a little bit, move, bring her arm up, anything that just kind of random movements that keep the baby from getting into a deep relaxing sleep. Okay, uh, but really, if your baby is uh, if your baby's regained birth weight and um, is peeing and pooping plenty, then I think you know you, you're definitely do, you're doing a good job and you're on the right track. 
All right, let's see. Here's a question. My son started out latching on really well, nursing consistently for 20 minutes at every feeding, 10 to 12 times a day during the first week. In the last couple of days, he's still nursing for a lot less time, like eight or 10 minutes, still 10 or more times a day, but much faster. He seems content when he's done, and I just want to make sure he's getting enough. He's now waking up a little more frequently at night every two hours versus every three or four. Okay, so um, he certainly could become more efficient. And um, let's see if I have, I would suggest um, doing things like, I don't think it's on this slide, on this slide deck. I would suggest using the breast compression um, so that when he starts falling asleep at the breast, you do a long firm squeeze and see if it, if it tanks him up and if he starts drinking a little bit more. Try nursing on three breasts. So you could try nursing on one side, switch him over to the other, and then when he starts getting sleepy on that side, put him back on the first and see if you can extend or increase the milk transfer during a particular feeding session. Um, but it could very well be that your milk lets down quickly, he gulps it down quickly, and as long as he's peeing, pooping, and gaining weight well, then I think you're doing just fine. One last question. Here's one. Oh, new mom. My milk has come in, and there are times when he latches and starts feeding, but then starts shaking his head, yep, and comes off the latch. Is he full or uncomfortable or needs to be positioned? Oh, this one is a tough one, isn't it? I call it the no-no face. It's like, it's like their mouth is around the nipple and they're shaking their head like, no, no, no. And you're like, it's right there. It seems like they can't find the nipple. Does Emmett do that? Yes, a lot. And especially at night, I think when he wakes up and is immediately hungry and he goes to drink and I'm like, drink, sip, it's right there. Like the nipple is in your mouth. But he, he shakes his head and he, he'll get on for a second and then he'll toss his head backwards and he we lose the latch and then I get frustrated. So yeah, we, this happens a lot. What's the answer? <laughs> well, I don't know exactly. It can be a lot of different things, but a couple things to think about. See if you can aim the nipple more toward the roof of the baby's mouth. They need to feel the nipple up against the roof of the mouth and have their tongue underneath it to begin to latch on. If they're really inconsolable, take them off the breast and let, give them your finger to suck for a moment. And sometimes just getting into that relaxing suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, breathe rhythm, and then you can take your finger away and put them on the breast. That might be another thing to think about. Um, one question I would have, though, is um, is is sometimes uh, the situation is called a super stimulus. So if mom has a, a relatively soft or flatter nipple and the baby is getting a pacifier, then they're used to something very long and firm in their mouth. And when they come to the breast, it's kind of soft and mushy and they have to make their own nipple there. Um, and they seem a little bit lost as to what to do. So that's just something I would think about. Um, and um, Another thing you might try if your nipple is uh, flatter is to um, is to manually express for 20 seconds or 30 seconds before bringing the baby to the breast. That can soften the areola and help the nipple stand out a little bit more and be a little bit more uh, present and graspable. But aim for um, trying to help him open his mouth real wide, bring him quickly into the breast when the mouth is open wide, and see if then maybe he will feel his tongue under the areola and the nipple up against the roof mouth and that will help him latch. Uh, the last thing I'll mention sometimes that, that causes this is what's called the gastrocolic reflex and that means that it's just the sensation of peristalsis. So in utero your baby practices drinking amniotic fluid um, and they practice peeing and that becomes amniotic fluid which then they drink some more of and so on. And um, But what they, and they practice breathing and they practice all these things but what they don't practice is pooping and the sensations of digestion and that they have that mucus that that, um, that meconium plug and their bowels just don't do anything in utero. And so um, what happens after your baby's born is they start drinking, swallowing the rhythmic movements of the tongue, propel the, the milk down the throat to the esophagus, into the belly and the tummy receives the milk and starts contracting and pushes the stomach contents into the small intestine, which inch by inch wakes up and pushes contents into the large intestine, which inch by inch wakes up until finally the baby passes gas or has a bowel movement. And it usually takes about five or 10 minutes for the entire GI tract from start to finish to wake up. So from the time the baby begins to nurse to when they get all squirmy and grunty and maybe pass gas or have a BM, that's usually about five to 10 minutes. So sometimes babies will clamp down, turn red, squirm, squeal, act a little fussy midway into a feeding. And they could just be reacting to the sensation of gastric motility, of feeling that liquid bowel movement 
whizzing through their GI tract a little bit. Um, it probably does feel a little crampy, and in the middle of the night when it's really quiet, sometimes you can actually hear their, st their stomach and their intestines uh, making those little squeaky noises. Okay, it's 1241, um, and I think we have to begin to wrap up. Next week, I'm going to do all Q&A, and I will come back to answer um, I, I won't, <laughs> as much as I enjoyed having Kate, I won't have a guest next week, and I'll just do all Q&A next week. Um, but what I, one thing I did want to do is um, see if uh, Kate would come back in a month or so, because that will be when she is right in the middle, sorry, Kate, mm -hmm. right in the middle of what I call the hardest time. So between weeks three to, to eight or so is usually, in my opinion, the hardest time in the life of a new mom and newborn, because young babies, I say this with endearment, they do three things. They eat, they sleep, and they fuss. And if they're not eating or sleeping, chances are you're actively involved in keeping them happy. And then around week three or four, it's kind of like the perfect storm. They're spending more and more and more time awake. They haven't developed any hobbies yet, so they pretty much want to uh, nurse and be bounced, nurse and be bounced all the time. Um, if they're sleeping, they're sleeping on you, exactly like Emmett is doing right now. He's just um, melting into Kate's <laughs> chest right now. Uh, and they don't like to be put down very much at all at that point. And um, that's usually, you know, partners gone back to work, family have gone home, the UPS truck driver doesn't come every day, and moms are beginning to feel a little bit exhausted and overwhelmed. So that's what I'd love to have you come back to. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Now, um, you guys really can and should click this link, and that will take you to Kate's blog. And then you can um, follow her on her blog because she's one of my favorite bloggers. I love the pictures that she posts. Um, she shared many photos with me. She sent me once a beautiful picture of her older boy, Owen, um, with, um, with spit up. Uh, he had <laughs> reflux. So for my gas and gas reflux and spit up oh my webinar, there's a wonderful picture of Owen with spew coming out of his mouth. He'd vomit, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know, somewhere I used a picture of you. I think it was from a newsletter a few years ago, a newsletter of you in your bathing suit, oh, yeah, pregnant right. maybe, I don't know. She's, she's a wonderful photographer, or maybe it's your husband. That's my husband, yes, yeah, not me. But there are the beautiful photos and great stories and just, you know, nice kind of um, real life day-to-day vignettes that I enjoy myself very much. And of course, Kate's on Twitter at now a home. So please do um, send her and like her and all that good stuff. And I will have her back in a month. And then I'm going to have her back a couple months after that. So maybe we'll have her back every every couple of months to just kind of have the, the check-in. Um, thank you, guys. And I, I do want to um, do a shout out to, well, there's lots of people I should probably say hello to, but Isis Kennesaw in Georgia. Hi there. And then Kara, because um, Kara has been very helpful helpful to me over email recently, and I appreciate that. Um, and Katie for taking extra time. Katie, you're late. You better go um, for taking time to be in our chat room today. So thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic week. Uh, come back on Tuesday at noon for the sleep webinar where we'll be talking about uh, some favorite sleep products like the white noise machine and various, uh, the, the um, Magic Merlin sleep suit. Oh, that's a popular one right now. Um, and then come back next Thursday to the breastfeeding webinar for all Q&A. And next week is, I believe, the beginning of World Breastfeeding Week, which is uh, starts on August 1st through August 7th. So we'll have lots to celebrate and talk about next week. Maybe some surprises, too. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for having me. This was very fun, and I certainly learned a lot. And Emmett is sleeping away, thanks to your tips. He's, he's quite beautiful. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Emmett.